use the same techniques now worry about electrons um, in principle helium-3 and plasmas where you have electrons and other nuclei being present and um, fermions um, have many more applications than bosons because they're just more systems around where they matter I work a lot on planets um, we also have hydrogen plasmas we can simulate we have the Sun for example we can apply these simulations um, we can also in principle study giant planets although all the simulations we've done on giant planets um, so far have been using density functional theory um, we also have now simulations that we use to help people simulate fusion processes so we will present simulation results where the electrons are treated as path and if the systems then the simulations are efficient when the electrons are really excited moderately or highly excited and this puts us in the regime of a plasma if you're interested in the electrons primarily be in the ground state you're going to uh, pay attention tomorrow and the day after when we talk about quantum Monte Carlo where the electrons are in the ground state. Path on the goals is about finite temperature quantum properties so the electrons have to be excited. So if the electrons are all quantum particles then the temperature scales um, work where the electrons are excited which puts us in the plasma regime in many applications. Nevertheless planets are exciting. Um, the Kepler mission changed to everything upside down we knew about planets. So if you think about the pre-Kepler, before this mission flew, these are the planets that had been discovered that orbit other um, planets. And they are given here as a function of orbital days. So one day orbits to about 10 days. And size relative to Earth. So there's quite a few hot Jupiters that were found. And then this mission flew for about a year or two. And they basically found 2,000 planet candidates. They changed everything we knew. So there's so many new planets have been discovered. There's a whole slew here in the regime between um, Uranus and Earth type planets. So we have lots of things to study, lots of things to understand. And the planetary science field is sort of, um, everybody is really excited. So if you think about hydrogen, where can we really study things with path and Monte Carlo? Well, um, you have temperature here from 100 Kelvin to 10 million and density changing also. So Jupiter is molecular and if you go towards the interior then it will basically go into metallic fluid state and this is metallic state um, hydrogen that has been otherwise Jupiter would not have a magnetic field so here it also gives rise to um, hydrogen helium rain in this immiscibility regime so if you increase your temperature you have an atomic fluid where molecules break apart and you enter this plasma regime and Pathanova Monte Carlo in principle can treat these effects um, very accurately. At high temperature or low density you don't need any simulations. The analytical theory is very good. Um, we can describe it as a collection of hydrogen molecules, atoms and also helium and helium with various electronic excitations and good um, equations of state exist. You don't have to do a simulation. So for the low temperature part um, you can do two things. The electrons are primarily in the ground state even though the nuclei are moving. So this puts electronically you better off with the ground state method rather than doing path angles. So there are two choices. There's density functional theory and you do molecular dynamics on the nuclei and what it basically means you're doing classical molecular dynamics with quantum forces and it's basically there's no quantum dynamics because quantum dynamics is a term the chemists have occupied for non von Oppenheimer effects this is classical dynamics with quantum forces or you're doing coupled electron ion Monte Carlo that is David Seppoli and uh, Miguel Morales worked on this a lot and that is been only applied to a hydrogen so far and it's the trick to go to low temperature while still moving the nuclei to explore this low temperature part where path on the goals that we'll describe now become inefficient. So here, this whole regime can be described as path on the goals. And you may be thinking, well, how do you do that? Well, you have one state, a ground state, you have in one excited state, one more, one more, one more. Well, isn't it going to be horribly complicated? If you have to compute a hundred excited states, isn't that going to break everything? Doesn't it really going to work? If I have to go to 10 million Kelvin, do I have to include a thousand states? 
And that's true if you want to treat these states individually, but it's not true if you do this pathogenically, because with pathogenicals, they get more efficient because when you go to higher temperature, the path gets shorter and everything works much, much easier. So in principle, if you're coming from below and you're adding excited states, you run out of steam if you try to push to more than 10 or 100,000 Kelvin. With pathogenicals, the exact thing, if you come from a million, everything is easy. And if you go to lower towards 100,000 or 10,000 Kelvin, paths get longer, filming on effects become very important, and it gets more difficult. So for um, these results, and we want to talk about these fermion methods now, and we can do them with and without nodes. There's two ways to do that, and I just want to review some of them. We, all the simulations where we publish, we run with nodes, and we'll explain why. Just for principal grounds, we want to this, talk about this direct method that doesn't use nodes also. So we already heard um, a little bit before, all permutations now come in with a negative sign. So how do we sample something with Monte Carlo that has negative signs? We always talk about probability distribution. So something that comes in with a negative sign is a problem because there is no negative probability. So basically what one does is one samples the distribution of the path, including permutations, ignoring the sign. So all the paths are generated like in the bosonic system. And then you figure out what is the permutation state of your simulation, and you tug the negative sign on your estimator. This is very dangerous to do for the following reason. You're sampling bosonic path and then you're putting a weight factor that's coming in a, in a, um, on the fermionic sense. So you're running all the permutations, you look at the state, when you compute your average, let's say the potential energy is 5. If the state um, has a positive signature, then um, you say you add 5 to potential energy. If there is far away two electrons that decided to permute, it introduces a negative permutation and your energy as a result of it may be 5.01. You add minus 5.01 to this 5 you already added. So you're, you're basically adding this weight factor of plus or minus 1 to everything that you average. This is exact, but it's very, very difficult to do and get converged results because if you have two permutations somewhere in your system, they change the overall sign, and then you have negative and positive contributions that almost cancel. So, Here, you have written down the space variables. So what happens to the spin variables? Because P should operate on the space speed. Curve. So we have, so the spin, so Jeremy, do you want to answer this question? You know about spin contamination. So we've just write down in the system, we split the electrons and spin up and spin down. And it only works for non, um, if you have no explicit spin dependence in the uh, um, Hamiltonian. So by f freezing the, we, we put one spin on the original electron. So I think by that already we do not have a perfectly defined spin state. We ignore this problem. If you ask us, I want the spin equals one state for some molecule, this may actually not work. Is that right, David? Uh, say that again. Well, if you want to, yes, spin contamination, if you fix the... Well, that's complicated. It's complicated if you want to work. Do you want to work in a state that's a definite spin? I think if the chemist asks... I mean, this is for thermodynamics, right? So in nature, you might get several spin states in the, in the Boltzmann distribution, right? Right. And so... You know, often we work in an SC representation that is where the total magnetic moment is known. And then, if you do that, then you can separate into up and down electrons, and that, that works fine for um, thermodynamic properties, not for a molecule, but in the, in the thermodynamic limit. So, strictly speaking, in mathematical sense, we have difficulty projecting out specific spin state because we, accept, we separate the electrons in all this. A few electron system, there's no problem, but in many electron bases, basically people haven't done that. I haven't worried about that. Oh, my, 
So I, okay, so I understand uh, that point. Mm -hmm. My uh, like concern is mainly application of the permutation operator. So when you apply the permutation operator, we just cannot apply it on a space variable because there will be situations where the particles will anti-symmetrize because of the spin variable. That's right. So if you apply a permutation to something with spatial and spin variables, you require that it map ones with the same spin into the same spin. So effectively, the permutation breaks down into a permutation of up spins and a permutation of down spins. Okay. Because the ones that would be cross have a zero matrix element. Right. So that's in the SZ representation. Uh, so, so I think where we're thinking that you wanted a total spin representation, no, no, that's yes. more complicated. That's, so yeah, strictly spin, yes, yes. there's something I did not explain. We only permute particles of the same type. So electrons have different spin are considered different, are distinguishable, and therefore they're not permuted. We put them in two different matrices, and this later determines, and we do not consider spins uh, exchanges across that, yes. So this method, nevertheless, if you carry the sign explicitly and you boson generate this method of bosons, the efficiency will go down dramatically because you have this um, cancellation of negative and positive contributions that will be important at low temperature. At high temperature, everything is classical. Um, permutations are not important. Their state is negligible. And um, the system is almost classical. And therefore, there is no fermion sign problem. If you lower the temperature, this will arise. And you could think like, well, I want to study things at an intermediate temperature, but I'm not worried about permutations. And they say this is sort of like a fermion system. It's not. Fermionic character arises just because these two things start canceling. If you do not do this properly, then um, you're not doing a fermionic system. And people do not appreciate, there are some people who, um, in the research community who do not believe in the fermion sign problem. And there are some algorithms that do not show this. Um, nevertheless, if you do the path sampling for fermions and you want to do it exactly, you run into this fermion sign problem. We'll see it this afternoon. And um, it's just, um, if you, this method will exhibit it very strongly. So the efficiency goes down. When you count how many negative and positive contributions, the efficiency scales like that factor squared of the algorithm, and that's the measure how different the bosonic um, partition function differs from the fermionic partition function. And that difference becomes very large at low temperature when your efficiency goes down as temperature goes down and as the number of particle increases. So with three particles, we can do everything, exactly. If you have six electrons, this is going to be the killer. You better, at low t if you want a t equals zero problem, you may want to use quantum Monte Carlo instead. So the fixed node method that David introduced and generalized for the fermionic problem works as follows. And you single out one point on your path, which you start is the reference point. You just, in principle, this ring polymers, at that point you break the symmetry, you pick out one point, and now you say you know, you assume you know your density, the sign of your density matrix and you only consider paths that stay within the positive region of that density matrix. So effectively, you're introducing a barrier where your path cannot go across. So let's just see, we still have two arguments. If one is now the reference point, but it's in any, you still have two arbitrary arguments you could put in here. We kept all the permutations, and now we integrate over all possible paths using our Boltzmann weighed all the action we had before. And, um, but now, we only allow paths that at no point in imaginary time cross into the negative region. So this is the um, uh, fixed node approximation because you do not let anything walk across a node. A node is where something goes to zero. And the path can no longer cross um, the nodes. And this will, as we'll see, eliminate all the negative contributions to our observables. Um, the, uh, uh, it will fix the problem of the cancelling uh, signs, but the problem is we have the fermionic 
um, density matrix appears on both sides. We cannot compute that part without knowing the sign, the density matrix. So the problem here is we do not know the fermionic density matrix, otherwise we would need, the problem would be solved before we started. But we need an approximation here. We, ha we have approximate nodes, and then within that set of boundaries, we solve the problem exactly. So if you tell me um, the, the many body density matrix goes to zero here and here, if this answer is exact, then I will solve how this main problem, what the function of your many body density matrix within t these two boundaries is exactly. If you tell me exactly where the, the many body um, density matrix goes to zero, this method will give you the exact fermionic result. In practices, we never know this answer. We always made the approximation, and we get very good results, but we have to keep in mind it's not exact. So, and it's difficult to test the error. So it's an uncontrolled approximation until someone um, spends another five years of um, basically coming up with a better thermal density matrix. Um, we'll not know how our existing density matrix, how good they really are. We have experiments we can compare, but it's a non-controlled approximation. So how does it work? David came up with this, and the argument is um, the following. You have your original state. Let's say your path starts here. This would be a positive contribution. If it wanders across here, it's a negative contribution as the result. And um, you ha introduce these nodes, given your, um, um, sort of your trial density matrix that you got from somewhere else. So someone has to tell you where the nodes are. Pathological Monte Carlo will not tell you this. So within that space, you sample all those contributions. If the nodes are exact, you will recover the exact answer. But you have to know where it goes to zero. So you th may think, well, I know where the hydrogen atoms looks like. I learned about the nodes of the hydrogen wave functions. Couldn't I just now a simulation of hydrogen and work this all out? Unfortunately, the nodes that we are talking about in fermionic path in Monte Carlo are the nodes of the many body wave functions, while for hydrogen states you look about nodes in an orbital. It's completely different. So the, they are unfortunately slightly difficult to determine. This is David's example here. You put, let's say, 32 particles anywhere in the cell, and now you start to move one of those particles, and you see where the many body wave function here goes to change a sign. So if you knew it or you make an approximation for free particles, you can calculate it. And you see what complicated structure arises if you move one particle. But the expression that you need is basically you need to be able to move all of them. So at high temperature, nodes tend to be straight walls, as we'll see. And at lower temperature, we will, um, they will be smoothed out. Do you have a question? Yeah. If we cross the nodes, even number of times, Yes, that's right. Why don't you allow those kind of moves? Okay, so let's just, there's one argument that I should probably have explained. So the rule is, if you're sitting on um, this node and you wonder how many paths are crossing from one side and how many paths are crossing from the other side, so you will basically see that the amount from both sides cancels just because the, um, the flux of path is related to the, um, to the gradient of the density matrix there. And so the two fluxes are equivalent. So um, that is one argument why you can get away with canceling them off. And I will give you a second one, a second motivation in a little example. So you're right, if you do this the direct method and you cross the node once and you come back, yes, it's positive. But let's just see what happens in this case. So um, let's just say the simplest way, which works fine at um, high temperature, is using free particle nodes. So we stick them in a Slater determinant, but now there are no longer wave functions in there. There are now um, single particle density matrices. And let's remember what they looked like. Um, we um, have these little Gaussians with two arguments. Now we have this functional form, so it's the same orbital, if you like, that goes in all these places. You have one, the row um, and the column argument. One refers to the first index and one refers to the second one. 
So in the zeta determinant, you have different orbitals and different particles. That's not what we do here. Here we have one type of functional form of free particle density matrix, and we have two arguments, and we make a determinant out of this by permuting or changing the first and the second index. This is our many-body density matrix. It works exact in the limit of high temperature, and it becomes more approximate at lower temperatures. And what you force, you're only allowing path that start with a reference point, let's say it's zero, and then stay within the positive region at every time slice. That's the rules. So you have to check whenever you move the path whether it crosses um, the node. And this solves the sign problem, as David has shown. So we also do a little trick. We calculate what happens if the path um, sort of leaks across the node in between, and we have a little correction which we call the nodal action that accounts for some of those effects. And it helps us to, um, to give a have a get away with fewer slices. So we also try to get away with uh, to improve on free particle nodes. That's difficult. I spend a lot of time doing that. And it is a um, variational approach where we solve the, uh, you want to do better than free particles, to go to lower temperatures with fermionic simulations. And we solve the Bloch equation given some ansatz. And the ansatz is Gaussians with some extra degrees of freedom. And I'm just showing this one picture here. Um, if you plot the density matrix as a function of temperature and it goes down in temperature, the original free particle solution is given by this um, blue dashed line. It will decay very quickly to um, some totally delocalized state. While our variational density matrix is a Gaussian that can actually settle down to this one hydrogen atom here. So we have a variational way, a very simple way to have Gaussian orbitals converge towards the ground state. But we're only considering a single orbital. By quantum chemist method, this is ludicrous. But um, by a finite temperature method, this is better than free particle nodes. So um, I'm still coming back to your question. So let's just um, review a little bit what um, you will compare at finite temperature and high temp and zero temperature. And what you will be learning in the next day, tomorrow and afterwards, is basically everything where the electrons are in the ground state. So um, you are happy if someone gives you the ground state wave function. And as long people, two people, one gives you wave function A and one other one gives you wave function B, who wins? Well, as long as they're both anti-symmetric, you can tell from the um, energy that you calculate the ones is better wave function has a lower energy. There's a basically an, a low, uh, the exact energy is always a lower bound to any approximate wave function. So there is a very, really rich rational principle. What you do if you run LDA calculations, you have some way of computing orbitals in an effective single particle level. And uh, Ron Cohen explained that the, the function of theory is more than that. But for us, it's important we do get some orbitals out of this calculation. And we can improve on those orbitals with yesterday's exercise to stick a Jastrow factor to account for correlation between the electrons. So this is level two in the accuracy. And what we'll do is step three is basically to run diffusion Monte Carlo where we need nodes. And we take the nodes from those orbitals we got from here. So that's step one, two, and three for t equals zero. So now we want to do that at finite temperature. We have a um, density matrix instead of a wave function. And we have a, a variational principle on the, Gibbs, uh, on the free energy that's similar. And um, we can, in level one, we would basically um, construct a variational um, solution to the Bloch function. Here we have a variational a solution to the um, Schrodinger equation. Here we need the Bloch equation. And it's the many-body Bloch equation we try to solve then in principle we could improve upon the solution by adding a Jastrow factor. We, we don't do that. At least nobody has gone that route to do that because it's not improving the nodes. Then we end up with level three where we do restricted um, path integral Monte Carlo and we need nodes from our step one calculation. So this is the analogy between t equals zero and finite temperature um, path integral Monte Carlo. 
So answering your question, I want to now describe, ex give an example for two particles. And we, can, we know how the node looks like in this case. And um, let's just see, I put two particles. So let's say there are three fermions. I know where the node of this density matrix is. And because it's Gaussians, I put them in the determinant. I know when they are on top of each other, then um, basically this is a node of the density matrix. So I start here, particle one starts at this location and particle two starts here. So I'm putting this in this R1, R2 space. So this is my starting point of the path. And if I want to do a simulation for distinguishable particle, the node doesn't matter. So anything where the particle starts and comes back to the original location um, will work. So particle type, particle path A and particle type B, B crosses the node, but the free particle, the distinguishable particle does not care. The nodes are not important. If I want to do distinguishable particles, I have to sample path A and B. So if I want to do a simulation with bosons, then a pure mutation means path one has to end up at the location of particle two, and path two has to end up at the location of particle one, which means in this diagram, the R1 coordinate has to end up at R2, which is just the mirror image of this nodal surface. So we have a new type of path appearing path C, which is not, does not exist in path uh, for distinguishable particle. So the answer we would get is basically we're adding A plus B plus C. It's exact, works. So now for fermions, the only change surprise is we have to add all contributions from the path C with a negative sign. It's exact. We have this cancellation. So now, um, for this is called the direct method. It suffers the fermion sign problem, but it is exact. And for the restricted path approach, you now enforce the node. So anything that walks across the node is automatically rejected, and that rules out path C and path C. So you're getting away with path A only. So the, path, the restricted path method is effective because A, there is no, if you have paths that come back to the original point, there's no negative contributions. So you eliminate A and B, you're canceling some of the positive against some of the negative, and if the node is exact, you get back the exact answer. So it, it, it's not that you have positive and negative completely canceling. It's not true. The contributions from A are very important. But some of the, all of the negative are canceled against some of the positive. And they, you take them out. A and B are eliminated. And you're left with A. You're left with positive contributions only. Any questions on this? I think if you're not confused, you may not have paid attention. It's normal to be confused about this. So I want to sort of um, spend a little bit of time on the calculations, and now I'll talk about applications. So um, unless there are some questions about fundamentals. Yes? Yeah, I think we, we don't have a good way of doing that. We can calculate, as you know, Gibbs free energy well, differences. Don't you think that's kind of an old argument? Now that you have thousands of processors, you just run these calculations at, at a whole bunch of temperatures and you integrate them out. Yes. That's how you have to calculate any entropy. I mean, it used to be, well, we could only do one calculation at one temperature and then you couldn't get the entropy. But now you could do hundreds of calculations along a line and, and phase space and then you just integrate them up again. That's what we did when we calculated the phase diagram of hydrogen. It's kind of an old way of thinking that, oh, we can only do one calculation. We have to get the entropy. Now, you know, you, this is something that's really good for parallel computers, is calculating the entropy. Yeah, so the argument is basically you cannot calculate the entropy directly. You, have, you can calculate free energy differences. Oh. In a calculation at a single temperature, you can't calculate it. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Basically, okay. yeah, but you can't. You that's, can't that's, a full, uh, that's a very restricted way of thinking about it. Yeah, but it's a good way because it forces you immediately, if you can tell, you can calculate the Gibbs free energy difference. It forces you immediately to think about, oh, I have to calculate this other state. 
because you can all get the difference with A and B, it tells you, well, how do I get A? What's the best choice of A? What's my state I'm integrating to? Yeah. So, okay, so you have two views here, so it's okay. Good question. <laughs> Low temperature sample view. Well, let's just yeah, we'll be able to see it immediately. There are some. It's difficult to do a low temperature fermion calculations with pattern models. So let me talk about a few um, um, simulations. The first one is basically on hydrogen, and you're going to compare with shockwave experiments. So what basically happens here in these simulations, you have um, nuclei. You have hydrogen is in a, pro, in a H2 molecule state the path of those nuclei, they're so localized, you can't really see them very well. So I stuck these sort of spheres on here, and the electrons, they wander all over, and if you average them out, you get the, the electronic density. But for an instance, the path will just have some arbitrary location. It will not look smooth whatsoever. The path integral is a stochastic process. It will not look smooth. It will not look nice. Even if you average it a little bit, it will look like um, like, I don't know, like you've dropped a thread of something to the floor. Only if you average enough, you get a smooth charge distribution. So nevertheless, the electrons happily bind the protons and you get a very nice molecular state at hydrogen here at 5,000 Kelvin and low density. If you then increase the density to something higher, you get some of those exchanges. You have, still have a molecular signature, but you're going to the close to the uh, molecular to metallic transition. And if you cross it, you go into a state where the electron paths are completely delocalized. And you go, it becomes more like a free Fermi gas. And it's conducting, it's a metallic state. And once they delocalize, there's no reason why two protons are bound. So you have a metallic state. In the path integral picture, this arises because these paths become permuting. So I already said, that we eliminated all negative contributions, but we did not eliminate permutations. So we eliminate two particle permutations, but three particle permutations are perfectly positive and have a positive sign. And um, you have many other contributions from permutations that are positive and they need to be kept. So the nodes have some, have two effects. They restrict the all path, but they also eliminate some of the permutations that led to a negative sign. So we've used this method to, put, to construct most recently an uh, equation of state so someone can do a fusion calculation from 10,000 to, I don't know, um, 100 million Kelvin. And people did simulations of simulating a fusion experiment. There's one application and you can download the resulting results of hydrogen. We've also um, used the path integral calculations and we combine them with density functional molecular dynamics calculation at lower temperatures. And for hydrogen under these conditions, the results are reasonably good. So if you do DFTMD and you do path integral Monte Carlo, you can construct one equation of state and then give it to someone else to run some approximate hydro code simulation of an experiment. Apparently, the differences between these two first principle methods are not very large. So People doing experiments on hydrogen, they lose either a giant gas gun and or a laser system or some Z capacitor bank. And what happens in these experiments is basically you run a shock wave through a system where you have a state at low density and it's as this snow plow sort of rams through the system, there's this compressed region of material that keeps growing and there's a shock wave traveling. So you're going from a state at low temperature and low density to a state of high temperature and high density and high pressure. And these typically are sort of plotted in this diagram of function of density and pressure. And this is called a Hugonio curve. So that is the way to compare with experimentalists because it's the only way they generate states at high temperature so you, and um, say high pressure simultaneously. So the first experiments, there were like two predictions. One was sort of the standard um, uh, sort of sesame model for hydrogen that we used for many simulations. And then Marvin Ross came along and said, well, this is not really true. Um, hydrogen should be much more compressible under these shock experiments. So nobody believed him. Um, but then they did the first measurements and found that indeed these laser shock experiments uh, sort of reproduced uh, Marvin Ross's unusual equation of state and that generated quite a bit of controversy. And so we claim that we have the best 
simulation method when I basically wrote my um, PhD thesis on this, and I could never reproduce those results. Um, with free particle nodes and even with the variational nodes, we always got hydrogen is not very compressible, and um, there's nothing we can do about it with, um, dense, with um, ab initio method. That's the answer you get. And it basically, the, all the more recent experiments show that um, here's one point um, from Marcus Knudsen and some Russian experiments. They all seem to follow the trend of hydrogen not being so compressible. So apparently, if you ask most people now, these original experiments should be discarded because the DFT simulations and pathogens predict that hydrogen is not very compressible. And all the later experiments seem to confirm this. So it was, um, I would say, um, a useful prediction for theory to question these um, findings early on. For helium, we actually almost in a similar situation. Um, if you do a DFT simulation, you're happy. You, there are some experiments, and you compare with them very well and there's no big problem. So if you do a DFT simulations further on, you get this Hugonia curve, and um, the result is surprising. If you add path integral, you get helium is actually quite compressible. And the argument is that it's electronic excitations. If you take um, a DFT MD simulations and add enough orbitals, you very nicely match onto the um, helium path integral Monte Carlo data. So um, we could make some predictions what experiments you would need, what machine you would need to use to generate such a state. So we made these predictions. And um, so we also calculated, compared with existing um, equation of state models, and there are some differences, but I'm not going to go into details. But again, what we are able to do is you combine the DFTMD results with um, path integral and with some analytical simulations, analytic methods at very high temperature, mainly the Debye model, and you can string them all together to construct one equation of state. So this is shown here in more detail where we plot the pressure as a function of temperature. But um, let's now talk about the actual experiment. So is it right or wrong? So they'd have a new method where they combine diamond annual cell experiments with laser shocks, and these are the first results that came out. So this is what I predicted with Pathanil Monte Carlo and DFT, and the results are clearly off. So again, we have a simulation problem in relation with the experiment. There's a big discrepancy, and again, the, um, the Livermore um, shock wave um, experiments were more compressible than theory predicted. They are able to increase the density by pre-compressing helium before they run the shock into it, and pick a higher starting density. If they do that, they get a different Hugonio, and the results are not far off. The difference is reduced. And if you compress it even more, we actually find agreement between theory and experiment. So it's only these low compressibility shock that show the largest deviation. And um, what basically happens at the highest compression state, we again, we find um, agreement within an experiment. And here, I have to say, the theoretical predictions were published way before the experiments were done. So this is one of the things theorists should do. <laughs> and um, basically, the latest result in that story is that there are, um, there's a correction to the quartz standard um, published by Knudsen and Desjole, saying the quartz is one of those materials they need as a standard for the interpretation of these original experimental results. And if you correct the quartz standard, then um, some of those points you will shift towards lower densities. So there was actually a problem with the experiments, most likely, although they may be repeated, we'll see how good the agreement between first principles method actually is. So, well, let's move on. The lab um, is about um, carbon and water plasmas. And what we basically want to do is um, to, again, predict the simulations for um, the inertial confinement fusion program, where we give them, um, we can generate materials that are at very high density, but the same, we reach temperatures in EV here of 100 EV that are comparable plasma, but to at a high density. So if you're successful with our approach, then we can treat the lower part of this phase diagram with density functional molecular dynamics, and then we can 
combine it with um, path integral Monte Carlo, or if you like, if you are able to write down an orbital free DFT version, you could construct this high temperature state. But the moment you're running out of um, energy with your DFT calculation. So we only published this earlier this year. Why was it so difficult to get a path integral calculation with elements that are heavier than helium? And the simple argument comes back to core electrons. So for the, the only way, existing way, to treat core electrons is by um, introducing a non-local pseudopotential. If you're able to construct a local potential, you, there's no problem. But if it's non-local, you want to take advantage of all the technology DFT community has provided us with and then run a path integral calculation on top, you run into a sign problem because this operator is non-local. So here, for local potentials, this is always positive, but here you get phase oscillations just because this is non-local. And it's, you can imagine that there's one path scat being scattered off of a um, core electron. And um, as a result, this has positive neg and negative contributions. So you get a sign problem even for a single electron. So um, that was the killer, at least nobody has tried. People tried to solve this problem rather than actually um, um, doing simulations and trying to solve, deal with, sort of run direct simulations where you have positive and negative contributions. The second problem is um, you need more accurate nodes. You have electrons sitting in your ground state and um, they are basically a heavy nucleus, they're more likely to occupy those ground states and the free particle nodes cannot capture that. So this is another fundamental problem with um, doing path angle Monte Carlo at lower temperatures. And the third problem in general is we want to use this reference point that determines the nodes. So the reference, if you move the reference point, the nodes will change at all other slices because there's this one argument which makes reference point moves, which you have to do, um, very, very expensive and your efficiency goes down. So for hydrogen or for the homogeneous electron gas, we can go down to one-tenth of the Fermi temperature if the system is very metallic. If the system is molecular, we have no fermionic exchange effects, you can do much lower. But if the system is substantially metallic, then one-tenth is sort of the lowest as we can go. Otherwise, then the um, if method becomes inefficient. Um, I already mentioned that we have an alternative way of treating electrons in the ground state, but in principle, uh, these were the three things that prevented us from doing heavier elements. And now let's just see what we can do. If you run a wall or plasma simulation with DFTMD and you put your P DFT code as high as you can, you include a thousand excited states. Maybe you can do two thousand it probably, you can push it to a million Kelvin approximately. But then it becomes very, very difficult. If you're good with theory, and you're, or not good with theory, you use the primitive model, you use the Debye model, there is still a substantial gap in temperature, and the Debye model will fail miserably below. But even here, you would question whether your DFT simulations are reliable. Ron Cohen told us this is a ground state method. It should not work at a million Kelvin. So you're not, sh A, you're running out of steam because you, there's too many electrons, too many f unoccupied orbitals. So the B, you do not know whether you get anything useful out of this. So these are the two things. So then Kevin and I actually tried, nevertheless, to run Path Angle Monte Carlo in the simplest possible way. And we ran it with three particle nodes using all electrons. We did not know, do non-local pseudopotential. We basically circumvented all the problems. And in principle, the surprising part is we can, with these things, go as low as 250,000 Kelvin, and we bridge the gap to DFT. And um, also, DFT seems to work reasonably well. This effect that there is correlation missing doesn't seem to be the killer if you are at 250,000 Kelvin. This, apparently the thermal properties of the system are not dominated by exchange and correlation, but the motion of the nuclei is probably more dominant, and therefore um, if, you ignore, if you don't do correlation sampling very well, it's not a big deal. So we are able to bridge the plasma regime to the um, condensed matter regime with this regime. We've done it for water, 
for two densities. We're plotting the pressure here. We've done this for um, a carbon plasma now also for water. So carbon now, we have a gap. And then with path integrals, we can bridge these two things. So the method works for water and for carbon. Um, we have um, now looked at the energy. The energy, the gap is not as large, actually. So you can still, nevertheless, PIMC across very nicely um, interpolates across all of those regimes. And um, we've also investigated the pair correlation function. So if energy, pressure, and how particles are correlated, um, these are the results at 750,000 Kelvin out of um, density functional molecular dynamics. And if we add our path integral results, the results are almost identical. So um, basically, for carbon and for water, we are reasonably successful. Um, nevertheless, um, the problem, the fundamental problem, is not fully solved. So what I, if enough of the electrons settle down into the ground state, the existing tools do not work. I started out by saying we've done years ago hydrogen and helium. Now we've done simulations with carbon and oxygen. And the question is, how do you go below the, um, the um, periodic table? So this concludes the third lecture of today. If you have more questions, please ask them. Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.